So what's GRO? Um, GRO is a behavior and signature based IDS framework. There was two versions of it. 2.0 is very, very much more streamlined than 1.5. 1.5, uh, if you weren't from Berkeley, it wasn't fun to use. Con.log is the net flow of the GRO output. We'll cover the differences there. The other neat thing about Bro is it has these script policies that run on both Bro 2.0 and 1.5 and expand HTTP traffic, DNS, SSH, SSH, uh, strange behavior, which is IDS evasion techniques or TCP retransmission. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between 1.5 and 2.0? 2.0 works much better out of the box. It's got 64-bit packages. If you don't want to compile it, there's a really great Linux distro called Security Onion that has it installed by default. Uh, compiling from source is really quick now. You don't need a site config uh, for analysis. Uh, however, custom Bro 1.5 source code will work well. Other differences, the scripts are now, uh, the word policy is now scripts. And little minor differences for the con log, but you'll see that. Is it the scripting capability from a like Python language or just something from No, it's their own like weird interpretation of it. Um, I think you could call other things if you wanted to, but there is a, there's a conference call. I think it's called GrowCon, and there's some really great YouTube tutorials. So I think the last two they had. Um, also, it's the book. The Tau Network Security Monitoring has a nice chapter on it. That was Bro 1.5. Yeah, it's a little old. Yeah, yeah it's a little old. Um, I think relatively four years ago. Was it four years ago? Wow. That's when 2.0? I guess so. Huh? Yeah, I thought it was a little sooner than that. Uh, certainly more than a year, but 2.0 is much nicer than 1.5. And the mailing lists are very active too, so if you have questions, you can use mail. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the 1.5 con log, we'll show this, we'll stream through this pretty quick. Uh, same thing, start, duration, the local IP, remote IP, Service, local port, remote port protocol, the original byte sent, responding byte sent, state, flags, and tag. Uh, and if you're curious, they do have all their old documentation on uh, old.broids.org. So based on this information, who can tell me whether bro is unidirectional or bidirectional? Anybody have any thoughts? Why do you say that? Yep, for that thing. Mm -hmm. That's the response. Yep, exactly. Full start. All right. Using Bro is easy. Bro, R flag, file name you want. That's default analysis. And how that, um, so there's many these scripts you can run on these PCAPs. If you do the local, uh, use a little bit more detection options. Uh, and you can do it specifically, just specific ones if you want. So if you only wanted the SSL validation one, you would type. Now, bro R and then the name of it, give the path. You can run bro on the wire, right? Mm -hmm. On the interface. Yeah. yeah. This is on that way. It's an IDS. All right, next. So here's the column log version two. So I broke it into pretty little graphs. Uh, so we have timestamp, unique connection identifiers, what bro creates. Um, <clears throat> oh, and this is a DNS example um, right here. Here's your origin. Information, your port, where it's going, I'll support the protocol it is, the service. So, Veronica, that's really nice. It does that there. The duration of it, the bytes one way, bytes the other way. Next slide. The state, this is something we'll get into. Uh, remember how Argos had those weird ones? This is a little bit better. Local missed bytes, history, we'll get into what that means. Uh, original packets, IP bytes, responders both way, if there's any tunnel parameters, and all this is, you can find it on this site here. Is the protocol identification based off of content or just port? Uh, that's an excellent question. I think I showed some <coughs> links later. Uh, you might have to check this out as well, kind of off the top of my head. So here's how TCP flex works. Remember when you're doing the iSilk uh, lab? You could see, you know, SIN, ACK, all that information. Bro does a little bit differently. So, SO means connection attempt seen, but there's no reply. S1 is it was established, but it wasn't terminated. SF 
means normal establishment and termination. Reject, rejected, S2. See here, is established, but there's a close attempt by the originator, but no reply sent from the responder. S3 is connection established, close attempt by responder seen, but the opposite of this one here. So when you're looking through logs, you go back and view these. All right, next slide. So now there's the other half of So RSTO, so connection established, but the original originator reported. RSTR, established, but the responder reported. RSTO, OSO, originator sent a SIN followed by a reset, but we never saw a SIN act from the responder. The next one is responder sent a SIN act followed by a reset, but you never saw a SIN from the reported originator. SH, originator says SIN, followed by PIN, and a SIN act on the responder. SHR, responder sent a SIN act followed by PIN, you never saw a SIN responder. And lastly, no SIN seen, just a midstream traffic, partial connection that was not later closed. Can I chime in? Yeah. So these seem kind of complicated, but in a sense they are. Uh, but really, if you, uh, if you had networking in college or anything, and you're familiar with the uh, concept of TCP as a state machine, these correspond to the end states uh, for the most part. So that's, that's sort of where the... Uh, uh, well, how, how it finishes. Yeah. 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 Does it finish uh, elegantly or did it not finish? So they're not really arbitrary. You can go sort of map it back to that. That's then assuming that uh, TCP is behaving the way it should. So if there's something funky going on... So You'll see a lot of these weird yeah. So yeah. every one of these is an indication of an error condition. Could be an error condition. Not necessarily or error. it might just not uh, have received it and it wants to retransmit it or something was misconfigured or it could be weird evasion techniques too. Yeah. Um, well, I guess what I really should have probably said is that none of these are what you would see if the TCP connection went through and the Yeah, that'd be the previous shakes were all Yeah, if correct. everything was beautiful yeah. and sunshine, if you go back one, like yeah, you'll see some more of these. Yeah. 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 And you'll see what I have old logs of that I talked in in pro format, you'll see them uh, where it's weird and where it's not. And that is sort of your normal connection was created if we're not successfully, right? Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Okay, so here's that field one I talked about. Um, so how this works is, I don't know how much detail I want to dive in here. Um, that's more with the bro configuration. You guys don't care about that. Missed bytes, this is worthwhile. So if there's gaps. Um, or if this is greater than zero, any analysis scripts would fail for bro. Tunnel parents, if it's over a tunnel, there's more additional information there. Next slide. So here's that history one. So in the field value, you'll see a sin without the ACK. Um, that's what S means. H is a sin and ACK, the handshake completed. A is pure ACK. D is just a packet with a payload. F is bin bit, R reset. C, bad checksum, that's worthwhile to know. I, inconsistent packet stream. So sin and reset with both bits set, that would be strange. Lowercase and uppercase um, indicates which one this came from. And you'll see that in the, in the logs. Let's flip back to this slide, computer review. Okay. okay, so the fun stuff, what makes Bro special. So a weird log contains unusual except, exceptions, activity that can indicate malformed connections, Traffic that doesn't conform to a particular protocol, malfunctioning or misconfigured hardware, or even an attacker attempting to avoid or confuse a sensor. Without context, it's hard to judge whether the activity is interesting um, or what's left up to the user to configure. And then the other log we care about is notice, and that identifies specific activity the pro recognizes as potentially interesting. Um, so in pro speak, activity is called notice. And the stuff it is on their current wiki of more information if you want that. So next slide. And I just want to add to okay. I mentioned it earlier, but the, the log we really care about uh, from a NetFlow perspective is the connection log, the conduct log, mm -hmm. which is what we talked about earlier with the, yeah. the flags and the, the state. And that's that flow, the, uh, the bro NetFlow net net format. Yeah. But you also need the other log too when you're running bro. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to actually open up bro and look at some of the stuff here. So if you go into your home student data bro folder, there'll be two. Um, stay just in the bro one. There's another one where I ran all the scripts. And open up the con log. You may want to pipe it out to less. 
so you can kind of step through it. <coughs> that will be up the big one, I guess. Giant. Anyone find the directory file okay? Read this column, okay? The, this count has that one from the back. Is that hard? Can't read it. The top one is pretty big, it's 40 megs. I think the other ones are what, 70, 96 or so? So we have the original time. That you will use it as well. Yeah. You guys want it closer? How's that? The air next? As we talked about earlier, there were those, see how there's like DD here, DS, DD. Those are things we talked about on those other ones. So what the slide was on, slide 102, plus or minus two slides. So remember, lowercase is from the responder, uppercase is from the originator. So that's that information there. And let me find a TCP example because I 
And here we go. Here's a TCP logger. So you have your timestamp. Sorry, it's not highlight. I hope it off a little slower. Um, and here's the unique TCP thing. So you have sin f, which means that was. The normal termination one. So when you go through, so but the one beneath it was RSTO, which was one of the stranger ones, which was the originator sent a sin followed by a reset. <coughs> but you can see how the row format it does give you a little bit more information in that regard, but not as easy to parse through. The other interesting thing about the bro data is your weird and other logs. So I'll give it out for you. So here's the notice one. So you see, let's see here, um, strange things that will list. So you see SSL, invalid, server cert, validation fail, detected successful SSH log on, pretty much the only one that comes up with there, which is interesting. And if you go to the weird one, you see a bunch of stuff. So you'll see unknown packet type show up. They'll give you the timestamp so you can look in the bro con log for around that time in October. For the what? Uh, yeah, I can try to do it like that. Is there any way you can, you can format some of the fields and the... Um... Yeah, so they're all um, tabbed and limited, so if you want to pipe them to CSV file. <laughs> I'm thinking about the, the timestamp in particular, I mean converting that that looks like that, uh, you know, Unix time. Yeah, yeah, Unix time. So if I was to show this to somebody, you need to go through a conversion process to figure out what day, day time of day, you know, that type of thing. Well, that's also, you bring up a really good point that whenever you're doing your network sensing tools, make sure you're, you're always on the same time zone. So if you have more than one geographic location, pick one across everything. Do it for that. Yeah. And make sure all your servers are on the same uh, time, seconds, and seconds. Right. Another interesting thing will come up with, such as this unmatched HTTP reply, and I'll give you the server name for that. DNS labeled too long, DNS truncated, connection originator sin attack, right here. Data before established, inappropriate bin, unmatched HTTP reply. And again, the nice thing is it'll give you timestamp information of when these things occurred. So what you do is you look at this, and then you go then and look at your con log, or if you have other NetFlow traffic, go look at that as well. Just a general question. If you have an unmatched HTTP reply, is that a technique malware guys use to come through a firewall on the outside? You're talking about a reverse shell report A? Well, if, if your firewall is programmed not to let anything that originates in, but it sees something that appears to be a reply trying to come back to include something behind you, you know, in your, your so called safe area. Uh, I, mean, I, I remember, remember reading the question something about for that. Veronica Center. Oh, another one. <laughs> Is that a technique for malware? Okay. Yeah, you, so you got an HTTP reply here coming where you don't have an HTTP request. Yeah, right. Yeah, is that something that somebody outside your domain could use to get through your firewall? Is that indicating that somebody's this is really getting off topic here, so I'll talk about you after that. I, I know that there's a way some people get through firewalls by sending replies to requests that were never actually issued. I'm just curious if you've, if you've seen that type of thing. Yeah, but I haven't. I just prefer that though. That would be, in my experience, that would be more of an indication of incomplete packet packet. Okay, so, which, so in the real world, world didn't make it anything. more often the case that you're not that perfect. Right. And a lot of what's in this gearbox is probably going to be misconfiguration 
you know, maybe drop package or just stuff that, you know, not everything in here is a, a security incident where alarm bells should start going off. Uh, so some of the stuff that you do, if it's indicating misconfigurations, you would send, send that, say, to your operations guys and say, fix your server. Or confirm that we are going to see a lot of this on a network is when you're going to be working attached to a lot of wireless environments. As your wireless environment becomes more congested, more and more of that shared space starts blinding each other out. Packet drop, you get packet drop, you get behavior like this. So when you start reaching saturation in the network radio space, you, you can bring this up to your wireless guy and say, hey, we need to find another solution. Thank you. Great question. So if you go through the bro weird log, you see all this additional information. But mostly unmatched HTTP replies, inappropriate events, data before established. And it'll also some DNS issues. I'm not going to go through all of this, but it looks like a running. Yeah, it's the same one, right? 10.2.20.60. And yeah, 10.1.10.69. So that's a nice feature of Brooks. So it goes a little bit beyond that flow and some PCAP stuff as well. So the other fun thing with Bro, which I want to point out, that you also get um, HTTP logs. So it'll give you things such as your git strings, and there's a fun show code later on in the blog file. Right, some of this you can get from the Yak API module as well. But it's not going to be in a standard, you know, NetFlow format. But this is the kind of information that you want to couple with your NetFlow. So you get your original NetFlow, but if you can grab this thing, gives you, you may not necessarily have to go to the PCAP. You could look at this thing and say, okay, this is likely misconfiguration. I'm not going to parse through that. But if you go in your folder here and you look at, you go to Documents, and then you go to Bro Results Write-Up. And you can look at malicious web source destinations. You will see so some interesting things. So it'll try, it'll show you all the attempts to get an FTP password file off one of the servers. It's interesting. They're just trying to move up directories. There's also some fun shell code, right? Oh, here's all the FTP or the SFTP one if you enable that bro module. Here's some of the shell code, or here's uh, our SMTP. I believe it's XORG. If you, if you want to run an XOR over it, you can see what it does. Get more of it. Here we go. And that's just with the default bro scripts. So in your VMs, you will see. <laughs> Um, there's two sets here. Uh, feel free to look through all the con logs, the DNS ones, all the ones here. And then if you go into every policy, you'll see some more there if you want to take a quick look at what the difference between them. So between the two is there's a grow debug command that'll basically run all these policies for you. Uh, the second folder has more log files for particular services if you're curious about that. So I think like software was interesting. I was in the default one. And I think at any time they try to grab a certain file. Yeah, Office Live patch, that information is put in there. So this information is important because it, in the very last slide is a really great paper Pull it up here by Thomas <coughs> Patak and Timothy Newton. And kind of how IDX evasion works. Um, I'll just kind of point some interesting points here. I'll let you guys read it in detail. Uh, it basically works on insertion and evasion techniques, where you shove things in or out of order in a special order, either trick an IDS to make it 
drop it and compile it, parse it, and parse it data, or it's going to get in this strange kind of confused state. So they go into how you change your arrival order versus the intended order, and that's operating system independent. Uh, Unix versus Windows will handle things differently. So if you saw things like strange TCP flag or retransmissions that are not matching this configuration, it could be indicative of this kind of behavior. Could you give me the title of the paper? Yep, uh, it is. I have a link on the last slide. Insertion, evasion, denial, service, eluding network of intrusion detection. So if you go to the slide, you go to the very last one, right here, it's the first link, and then I have some black hat slides and a guy reading off a video of it. All right, so this paper is one of the first on IDF evasion techniques, uh, the sort of general reading. Um, I'm not getting there today, but it's still worth understanding going to that. And that's where it comes into where you're looking at your different uh, flag kind of behavior or all these kind of tools. So you're saying, seeing weird combinations of things that aren't configuration. I would use that paper as a starting point. 